this small but massive podcast, I'd like to welcome Mr. Keith Harkin, uh, singer songwriter, studio boss, entrepreneur, uh, <laughs> owner of Glack House, tourist accommodation, and all around nice guy. Welcome, Keith. Paddy, what's the crack? You're looking fantastically well. Likewise, if I could hug you and jump on you, I would I? <laughs> always give a distance <laughs> one. There's a distance one. Here, earlier on there, just for the good people before we start off, uh, you done a few tunes. I did. Uh, the, so along with the podcast, uh, we've been doing uh, the back road sessions and Fair Plenty, you done three new tunes for us. Do you want to tell the people out there what they were called and yeah. how they all came about? Yes, sir. Um, the first song I done, um, provided that they're all played back in that manner, <laughs> the first song was uh, a song called Leaves Are Just Regrets. Or no, that's not true at all. It's a song called The Rain and Me. Um, and uh, I just thought, you know, I noticed over the lockdown and the last year that everybody in the world has went through, um, you know, I actually noticed like a few people I knew had passed away. Yeah. And it got to the point where I was like, it wasn't because of COVID. Well, it was because of COVID, but it wasn't because of the actual COVID. They, they had committed suicide and stuff like that, you know. And I noticed other people that I knew talking about other friends and stuff like this, that things were go seemed to be going that way. For my age group, I was noticing more people my age were going down that road. And uh, I just thought, you know, I noticed <coughs> lots of people saying, you know, if anybody needs anybody to talk to, you know. So that yeah. was kind of the idea of that song. I was like, bas I'm basically saying, you know, if you tell me something, don't worry. It's just between me and the rain. You're there to support the person. 100% And uh, I suppose it's like, it's it's a theme that's coming up, Keith, in a lot of the podcasts is uh, the mental health of, uh, um, of musicians and how they uh, how they react and their friends, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it's something that's uh, that's relevant at the minute. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's always good to get it down the song, I suppose, for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, um, you know, for me too, I'm a musician myself and my world's yeah. been turned upside down yeah. for the last two years like everybody else. I mean, I played those few songs today and that's like, I was saying, it's only the third gig I've done since March last year. That's and amazing. for me, that's a strange thing. Like I'm normally, I've been on tour since 2007 without stopping. And I really mean without stopping. Like, yeah. Like if I wasn't on tour with Celtic Thunder, I was on tour doing my own stuff. And it, from, to go from like 150 shows maybe a year to three and a year and a half or two years yeah, that's like yeah. your whole life you know people will think we're really <laughs> really lucky having that third gig in the year off you you know what i mean <laughs> and new tunes and uh, well that's brilliant and uh, the second song you, you done as well you were saying that the whole three were new and that was something brilliant for us uh, the second the song sessions. was um it's a song well our old house that you're talking about black house yep. the place we bought in Nine Island in donegal and it's about 160 years old. Wow. And everybody we meet on the island, they're all lovely people. And they're like, oh, I was born in that house. Or, you know, oh, I was my, I used to go up and collect the water from the well. It was a Killian house. That's but, right. And but, but people maybe listening out there uh, that wouldn't know what a Killian house is. A Killian house to people out there is a house where people would gather, mm -hmm. uh, they would drink cups of tea, whiskey, mm -hmm. beer, have the crack, maybe a sing song, <gasps> tell stories, and they could be just on the road on the way by. And right. there could be someone within that house has got this maybe. super attracting power that, you know, to get people into chat. Maybe, you know. maybe so, you know, and... Uh, was something that old, I don't know, I love old stuff, old cars and guitars and the house was no different. Yeah. And I was sitting there one night in the middle of January and I just finished the tour of Christmas and I flew back to do work, you know, and you're digging all day out in the yard and building stuff and the rain's running down your neck and you're going, what am I doing here? But I was sitting that night in, in the house and I hadn't got the TV on, I had no radio on, I just had the fire lit and I always feel that there's company in the fire. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's like it's a loving thing in the room with you, the fire, you know. Continuously taking different shapes and forms. It's an amazing thing to yeah, sit and watch. Thing. Yeah. And I just started thinking about the oil. I looked at the door and there was a boot mark on the door, you know, and I just started thinking about all the people. Yeah. Many as a man sat there over the 150, 60 years, yeah. like myself, going, what did I do buying this uh -huh. house here you and know. cursing but it? But the know? yarns in the house have been brilliant. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you yeah, imagine yeah. the amount of parties and laughter oh, and yeah. crying yeah. and rows and yeah. fights and births yeah. and deaths. And, and going back to what you said earlier on about out digging. A lot of that because it's 150 oh. years old so obviously around it that have been the digging 100 you know, the working of the land 100 yeah. you know there's a, a jimmy webb song called um is it this old house too he has a song but of these old walls could talk that's what it is yeah. basically it's, it's that that idea you know yeah. that concept of just if that house could talk yeah. and that's the way i feel about it you know and, yeah. and now us living there we we 
weren't married when we got there. We got married on the grounds of it. We had our first kid yeah. there and we're yeah. fixing it up now. And, and that's that family tradition going forward again from a house you know, that's 150 years old. Aye. Which is and when amazing. I'm dead and buried, somebody else hopefully will do the same thing there. Yeah, you because know? you've built it in place now that it'll last, you know, the next good while because you put a lot of effort into it. Hopefully. A, a lot of investment. And uh, to be honest, it looks brilliant. I was Thank up you. at myself and I it's an amazing were, place for people. Like, we'll chat more about it as, as, as we go on. Uh, so the third song, you said you wanted to belt out a good happy one. It's happy, I, it's basically like, you know, um, leaves are just regrets. You know, we all dwell on crap, you know. Yeah. We, we all dwell on so much stuff. And then I look at a big, strong tree, you know, and the tree has these, you know, every year it grows big and strong. And then it hibernates and the, the leaves that it's spent its whole life trying to grow just dwindle away and go to the ground and it recycles itself. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, if we can just stay strong and like a leave is just something that's going to be there for a while, but look, just let it go. Yeah. None of this shit matters. Uh, some flowers just bloom for, for a wee while and they disappear, but they're, they're amazing when you see that. Do you know what I mean? Blooming. Yeah, yeah. It's like there's one, one of the verses in the song is, let the sun come kiss your lips. This world is at your fingertips. And I was talking about this current day. I know these days are hit or miss, but that's all right. You know, it's okay. Mm. <laughs> shit happens. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people are in... Uh, I suppose, in a mode at the minute, like we were uh, having a wee cup of tea earlier on and we were saying about, you know, um, like people being jump-started again, literally, you uh -huh. know, to what we were and how we uh, integrated, uh, how we speak and how we're about. Like, uh, we've come from a world of uh, hugs and shaking hands and kissing to a world of masks and... Uh -huh. and uh, um, um, space between us and all Aye. these things and uh, so uh, definitely that what you're saying there would uh, resonate with a lot of people and Aye. a lot of different walks of life uh, not just being being creative uh, just working and whatever role you have in society it was tough for everyone for everyone and I think now uh, as you said there's a wee opening we feel there's an opening things are starting to open up people are getting more confident uh, and hopefully that'll all change you know hopefully and, so yeah. I mean it just we all like to think life's a bowl of cherries, you know, but without without the lows, you don't know what a high is, you yeah, know. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I just feel like it's embrace the things that are crappy. It's like it doesn't, it's not nice. It's all learning, Keith. It's all learning. I mean? I mean, and because uh, every situation that any of us are in, uh, we take a decision making. And uh, sometimes uh, we could be younger and we think we kind of know what that answer should be. But uh, when we look back and in, in hindsight, when we're older, we go, Oh, I was totally out, you know, I was way off there. Aye. But you don't know it at that time. And as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, it's okay, you it's know. It's all right. And uh, so, so people out there, they'll have three uh, brand new songs three to new listen songs. to, which is amazing. Uh, so, Keith, you were brought up uh, in Derry City. Yes, uh, sir. Till you were eight years of age. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was it like then for you growing up in the city? Did you live in the, the water side or the city side? City side, Foil Springs. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was a city slicker. My mum and dad, my dad's from Craigan. My mum's from Elmwood Terrace, um, just down the street. And, uh, you know, I went to school in Rosemount. Yeah. But my mum and dad just wanted to get out of the city and we moved to Burn Foot, which is only, and I remember, like, that's, that's 27 years ago now. And back then, everybody in Derry was going, you're moving to burn foot, <laughs> which is only six minutes over the border. Yeah, like, yeah. But then that was like, But it was what? a difference in night and day because what would have been going on then, and, and people should realise, was a lot of stopping, a lot of interruptions uh, to going over the border. And next thing, it was like birds singing, a brand new... <laughs> no, no, do you know? Because I remember when I was younger, you know, you're thinking, um, people always say, you know, are you there yet? Are you there? See, see once you would go over the, the, the then border. I know there's no border now, but the then border, I was like... It this is, is deadly. And it's even daily. It was just the same fresh air and the same <laughs> land, the same mountains. But you know what I, I know. mean? Oh, I do know what you mean. Yeah. Like I, I, I know what you mean. And like even, I don't know, like I love, I'm very proud of Derry City and where I'm from, but I'm also very proud of Donegal. I've grown up there my whole life. You yeah. know, and Donegal people have always been very supportive of me. Yeah. Um, it's an amazing place. Donegal, I think, is very, very special. Yeah. Um, but so is Derry City. Derry City, like, I'm very glad that I grew up in a city like Derry. Yeah. It gives me... Um, There's a community, isn't The community spirit's different than some bigger cities, you know For I mean? sure. Yeah. And not only that, though, like, there's something about growing up in Derry, especially being a musician, especially being a surfer musician 25 years ago, and everybody's like, look, your man, the big surfer dude. I'm glad it gave me that edge of, like, being able yeah. to... You had to stick up for yourself. Yeah. And in, in the music scene in Derry, you had to be good. Aye. And I don't mean that in a cocky way, like the guy was good, but there were so many talented people out there. Yeah. So if you weren't good, you weren't going to get up 
and singing. You were driven. You were driven uh, from early, from an early age, and that's something uh, still with you to this day, and I've, no, I've known you for that over the years. But when you then moved to Donegal, um, I suppose you were going to a different school, maybe a different speed, a different whole, and uh, you know, interlocking of people uh, in a, a rural Donegal, as such that uh, people should know. Like you're here in Balmas Green, a rural town in South Derry. It's uh, right. that same effect, as you All know right. what I mean. Uh, so when you went there and you went to primary school. When kick started your interest, you know, in music, was it something, uh, you know, did you just always get into it? Was the music in the house or what, what kind of styles were you listening to when you were at primary school or had you other influences, if you know what I mean, people older than you or whatever? I mean, back then, I didn't really have my own musical taste, but I had my dad's and mum's yeah. and they had yeah. great musical taste. Yeah. You know, my dad played guitar. He played in the bars growing up in Derry. There you are. And he was like... You know, Chris Christophe, all the stuff like nowadays that we all are, you, I know, that like yeah. we would all listen to. You know, yeah, if you're yeah. sitting at a party, Neil yeah. Young, Chris Christopherson, yeah. Glenn Campbell, Harry Nielsen. Yeah. Um, you know, like all the, all the greats. Yeah, and, and da- all good songs to sing along with. All good sing-along songs. Yeah. That's one thing my dad's songs. There still you- to this day, <laughs> if we're in the bar playing... <laughs> My dad will play a song and the whole pub will be singing. And he looks at me and goes, hey, you are a nice song. And I'm like, I don't fucking yeah, know that's sing along. That's a silver song. dollar. That's <laughs> a know. dollar. Keith, that's a silver dollar one. I don't do sing along. You uh, know? No, but it, it shows you, uh, I suppose, it's, and it's all entertainment. You know, it, and, but what you were learning there was the craft of uh, going out in front of people, singing from your for father, sure. not being scared to open up and sing. Because sometimes, you, you, you know, there's uh, a lot of good singers and they just, they don't always just open up to of sing. Like, you know, do you know what I mean by Yeah, that? of course. And, uh, so then when you went on to secondary school, where did you go then? Was it a case of going to Letter Kenny? The big I actually went, I went back to Derry. So I, 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 was, I was the first year at Lumen Christie and... Uh, Music there, I don't music with anybody else, but I still play guitar. And yeah. there was a group of people, there was a band, remember Scruff, the band Scruff? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. All them lads were, they were, always, we were all in class together. Do, 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 do. That's right, die. that's right, Scruff. Uh, um, Connor. Connor and Connor Peter. Same, yeah. And uh, Aiden, yeah, the and, other guitar uh, player. And I can't right. remember who and, played uh, drums. Pete Eastwood. Pete Eastwood, aye. Yeah. Who, who played the drums? I can't remember. Can't remember who played the drums. But they're, they're going, they're going to hit us now. We should have all this information in front of us, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, the drummer is. Who is the drummer, Keith? I can see him. I'm impressed they I even remember three of their names. I can feel names. him, Keith, but I can't figure yeah. him out, you know? And so that was good because... But uh, I was always a lone wolf. Like, I never had a band. And it's not for any reason. And it's not because I wanted to be on my own. I don't know, it just always seemed to be a solo artist. I never... I always was more interested in the song. Yeah. And writing a band about a song. And, like, I wasn't as interested as... Get in the room, rocking out, which I, which I love doing yeah, now. Yeah. The older I've gotten, but like even still to this day, like I love. I'm all about the song and and, 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 and I genuinely about the song. don't care if anybody likes it. I don't mean that in a cocky way. Like yeah. I really want to. For me, I, I love writing them yeah. kind of songs because if I don't love it. It doesn't matter if everybody else loves it. There's no yeah. point in me singing it. Yeah, but you're feeling it and putting it out there, and that's your style. There's For nothing sure, wrong with that. There, mm-hmm. I mean, you could have the best mitts left and right, and one could be into thrash metal, and another could be into you know hip hop and punk and, and mixing down and big production and all. And you're still sitting there in the middle singing the song, Aye. you know, and that that's totally all right. And so when you were at uh, secondary school, like. Uh, uh, how did that go for you? Was it something you, you know, did you know earlier on that I want to do music and, you know, like, and, yeah. uh, you know, because, and what age did you left school then, about 16? 16, 16? I left Lumen Christie when I was 16 and then my ma asked me to continue on my A-levels so I agreed to go to the college, yeah. St. Collins College and I stayed for two years and then when the exams came around I didn't even walk in and do them. I just knew, you know, I was more than capable to do them but I knew yeah. doing two, putting the stress through myself of doing a, two A-levels and IT and an A level in biology. Yeah, you were never going to cut up some some uh, mouse, and you and you you know, and you were never going to start programming. I was already playing in bars, and I was already doing my yeah. thing. And, and yeah, you know, I was playing. I was singing since I was four years old on stage at the faces and stuff like that. So I, yeah. I knew I knew the taste of what I wanted to keep eating. Well, funny you just mentioned faces. Uh, uh, my friend Q he was an Irish dancing teacher. I was chatting about uh-huh. earlier on, and. Um, and that's where I actually sang myself one time and he reminded me that I beat him and I won it. And, <laughs> and the comment, as I always say in the podcast, was the only thing wrong with him, the judge says he needs to stand still. <laughs> used to say the same thing to me too, there funny. you go, that. So it must be something about... They used what, to say the same yeah. thing to me. Well, there you go. And uh, so the likes of... Uh, and then at 17, you... Uh, Moved to London. Mm-hmm. Uh, and was that a case of sort of, were you writing songs at that time, Keith, or had you released any songs? Or no. was it a case of just 
I'm going to head away. You were in the burnt foot. You had a foot in Derry, so you're a bit of, you know, and then the wee bit in the middle was just swinging, swinging in the borders uh, and such. <laughs> and uh, so you then moved to London. How did that all go? And what was it like for you there? Um, London was amazing. It actually ended up, there was an, there was a, an offer for a record deal at the Nerve Centre. And there was some uh, producer that was coming from England. So I was like, all right. And I went up and told them I was a songwriter. I had one song and it was called My Mind. And they were up and there was a guy called Andy Wright, who I was telling you about earlier on, a dear friend of mine, Jillian and another fella. And uh, I went up and sung my song, whatever. And they were like, oh, really good. They're like, have you any other songs? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. I was like, would you like a cover though? And they're like, all right, do a cover. I only had one song written. <laughs> And then they brought me to London to write and record. It was supposed to be for two weeks. And I didn't come home for over a year. And it was in Metropolis Studios in London, which is like, to this day, arguably the best master in a mixing studio, yeah. you know, yeah. at this side of the world. It really is one of the highest end studios. And I remember being 17, 18, and I just arrived that day. And at that time, it was around the time where the Verve were massive and all the pop bands like yeah. Sugar Babes. and Oh, uh, yeah. Was and it I, the sort of the the nineties that? Well, it would have been the two thousands, early two thousands, early two thousands. And uh, I remember my first day there. I walked up and there was a restaurant and bar and stuff in the studio. That's how you like you know it was pretty fancy. Yeah. It is a pretty it's an amazing studio. And the first day I was there, Richard Ashcroft walks in, and I was just sitting there going, "That's Richard Ashcroft. That's crazy." And he sits down beside me, and he's eating McDonald's, and he goes. He just looks at me, he's all, oh, it's crack. And I was all, I was, well, he didn't say, what's the crack? <laughs> <laughs> I was all, what's crack? And he says, do you want a chip? <laughs> I was all, I, all right. <laughs> and I was sitting there going, I'm fucking eating Richard Ashcroft's chips. This is sweet. I'm never leaving London. Ah, but that was, I suppose, that was your first uh, introduction to someone that sat beside you whose band had been around a good few years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, had uh, then broke with two big hits. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, all of a sudden they were just, they were the headliners at all the festivals massive. and they were massive. And uh, so you were in the same room as, uh, as them. And uh, how long then did you sort of then, when you were on there, did they release your music then? Or was it the case that you just sort of, that was something they wanted to do? And then, you, you, you know. It's you, a long story short, but the guy who was supposed to fund it all the week before I arrived went to prison for tax fraud. Um, and it wasn't Andy or none of those guys. I don't want really to say his name, but there was a guy looking to fund the whole record company thing. And then we found out he was trying to fund it to get rid of more money. Basically, it was uh, a write-off. He, he was so, washing his laundry. Washing his <laughs> laundry through me. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> through your single. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. That's what the album was called, Washing Your Laundry. <laughs> but uh, I, so the week before I was to go to London, Andy was like, Man, I'm really sorry, but like, you, we've no money and whatever. And I was all, dude, I caught my job. Uh, like, I was like, I have to come. And Andy, the sweetheart that he is, we're best buddies now. Yeah. We still are. He was like, all right, come over. And then after a few weeks, I was like, man, can I just stay here? I was like in this big studio with all these massive pop stars walking yeah. around. Like, I came from Derry, Donegal, and yeah. all the people you're watching on top of the pops, basically, every and day. All and all like, recording and, and mixing, yeah. Like, but that, the bat's going to give you a wild buzz too to, oh, to be what? there and to write more maybe. And, and then on a scene, and of all the studios I've ever been in, the atmosphere that those fellas created, Gavin Goldberg and Andy Wright in the studio, it, they were still the best of crack. Them yeah. lads are still together today as a yeah. team and it was always a, it's always yeah. the best yeah. fun. Everybody yeah. they have around. And I was like, as if this is what, I got a great introduction to it. Yeah. I've had been in studio sessions where it hasn't been like that. Yeah. And the, the producer. There's been no crack, it's all been really and the producer is very old school and bossy and not nice. And, you yeah. know, I've, I've went through all of that. So I got introduced at the, a great time. And I was yeah. like, if this is what it is, I'm going to do this. Yeah, there was a new energy maybe about uh, at that time in London. What the new, these new bands were cutting through and, and For you, sure. were, you were in among it. And uh, did that give you any, like, sort of, I suppose, when you were there, you stayed for a year, as mm -hmm. you say. And obviously, uh, at that stage, you wouldn't have been sure about... Uh, Get, you definitely get inspired by it, but you land at home, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden there was uh, a rehearsal in the Millennium Forum. Uh huh. Yeah, you came back after London, and uh, your father brought you to it. Uh, were you apprehensive of that uh, sort of going to that For sort sure. of rehearsal, and you weren't maybe sure what it was? And, and I imagine it's it, it would have been a daunting enough thing. You're arriving at something, you like here you're going, you're mixing with oh, as you sure. say Richard Ashcroft of the Verb and all these different. Uh, uh, bands that are hitting the charts flat out, and then you you're in this, uh, you back to burn foot over over. You crossed on a dairy, land in the Millennium Forum, and how did that all go for you then? Uh, as I was young... actually I was actually sitting in the nineteenth hole having a pint with my dad, and my dad was reading the paper and seeing an audition for a thing called Celtic Thunder, 
and I was like, I was after coming from London. I was a rocker. Uh, I was nineteen, and I was a hardcore uh, rocker. Uh, I don't do auditions, Dad. You had the swag and all. Do you know what I mean? I did the swag, like and black all. eyes. You know, I did just the swag like, and all that. All the massive. <laughs> they already had it was dairy. You've got the swag when you're from dairy, like you walk like no. Oh, right, never mind. Like gangly oh, arms okay. on you. Hi, 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 keep hi, 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 hi. So you were there, definitely, that, definitely. Your dad seen it, and I hadn't even got the money for the taxi. I mean, I was all. Go on, do it. I said, like, I'm not doing nothing. No audit. And he was yeah. like, made me do it. Got a taxi. He didn't make me do it. I was like, all right. Got me a taxi. And the taxi man brought me up to get me a guitar from the house. Went to the audition. And I didn't even know what it was. And funny, they didn't know what it was. They didn't know what Celtic Thunder was yeah. then either. You know. Yeah. And I went down and done the, a couple of songs. And Phil Coulter and Sharon Brown was there. Were they, they like the producers? Of well, Sharon owned the show and she had Phil and they produced the first couple of records for it. Yeah. Um, and that day at the first audition, they go, look, we haven't picked anybody yet, but we want you to be in this show that we're creating. That's and I was like, all right, cool. What is it? And they're like, oh, well, we're going to, they kind of built, they had me first and then they, they picked other so people. It was like, uh, the whole idea then was to get uh, different type, different types, of obviously singers with uh, different styles of voices yeah. to sing the, the different songs that Jim's were about to sing. And you were obviously first done. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so the block then was going to be built around you as such, you're saying, and all the different... China, they don't yeah. like that. Because like, yeah. even then we had to do second and third auditions. But they told me they were like, look, just to like everybody else. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, just to feel comfortable. It, They're yeah. like, you're, you have to come and do it again, Keith. But look, you're through. Uh, so I had to keep going down. And the rest of the lads all know that now. Like, yeah. Like, but, but at the time, you know, I didn't know who any of them were. You yeah. know? And where did everybody else sort of, for people out there listening uh, about Celtic Thunder, lots will know about it, but maybe people that mightn't know about it. Like, for instance, earlier on, uh, there was a couple of local fans and a young guy, <laughs> you come in uh, and like, it shows impact that Aye. the show made when you've got uh, one of the... Our, uh, one of our young uh, people coming in for guitar lessons wanting to learn your version of uh, Sound of Silence <laughs> and all of a sudden you're here in the building and he's meeting you. So it has made a massive impact. And so when everybody sort of got together, where did they all, where were they all from, Keith? They're all from, well, you'd be Damien from Derry as well. He was only a baby, he was only 14. Um, yeah. You had George Donaldson. But the thing was, the rest of them, well, Paul Byram, he was from Dublin. Paul was like an operatic singer. Paul had a career in music, you know. Yeah. The rest of them, like Damien was 14. Yeah. He was doing a few, I think he'd done a charity album for Foil Hospice, Fair Play Um He, George, was a coach builder in Glasgow and he played in the pub on a Sunday night. There you go. He worked, like just worked in a bus building factory. And then Ryan was a full-time accountant and he done gigs at the weekend too. There you go. You know, so, but I was like, I was, my head was buried on the music, like I was a yeah. musician. You were the, yeah, you were the one that wanted music and Aye. you were the one came out and it's funny that you're the first one picked, you know, Aye. because maybe, uh, I suppose, uh, Phil and Sharon noticed that, you know. That, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And so how did it all build then from, from there for you then? So what was, what was the timeline like for, for coming from, you say, burn foot to a show of that stature and how do you build upon it or how do you go out first? Because remember you chatting some, one time to me saying that there's certain shows be pitched in America Aye. and then all of a sudden, do you want to explain a wee bit about that Aye. for people? Well, there's like a TV station in the States called PBS. It's like the BBC, but you've got like BBC. Imagine like all the different states of the counties of Ireland. So you've BBC Donegal, BBC uh, Derry, BBC Tyrone, BBC Sligo. But it's PBS. You see so PBS, all different states in America. And the PBS station um, basically... It's like a pub, PBS is public broadcasting station. So the public fund it. So they look for content to put onto their show. And in turn, they sell your show, basically. But you don't make really any money from it. It's just the publicity you uh, get from yeah, it. Yeah, so it's about... Um because funny you say it, I was, I was out in the States a couple of years ago and I seen the likes that there's putting up, you know, they were putting up these kind of operatics or, or you know, yeah. like plays as such. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when that goes up there, then do people sort of... People, Look at it. people pledge on it, then they phone in because it's their station. It's like, you know, somebody like small but massive, Glasgow uh, Bury, and yeah. somebody goes to you, Paddy, love what you're doing. There's a hundred pound. Get you. Get and in you. turn, you might give them a ticket to a show. Get you. You know, so and they're it, patrons as such. Patrons, aye, that's uh, basically So that was patrons before maybe the whole internet was doing that patron thing. Oh, for know? sure. So people, that, that model was there already, and, and I suppose that's really good. And then, so obviously, people put in then, does that then mean you can take the, the lorries and road and. Well, that's how it all started out. Yeah. Like, you know, Sharon, we filmed the first show in Dublin of Celtic Thunder, and that was 2000. I was 20, so that's 15 years ago. Um, and then it was just pitched to PBS and stuff like that. She'd already done the thing with Celtic Woman as well. She invented that. Oh, yeah. Which is massive. That's that even massive. bigger again. Yeah. You know? 
Um, that was the biggest selling album. And the album, you mean? The, the Celtic the, Woman's like a show. Yeah. It's just like, it's a Celtic Thunder, only it's women. There it's the go. same concept, you know, five oh, Was women. that before Celtic? Aye. Yeah. Aye. So she invented that, basically. And then there she went go. on to doing this. And then it was like, I don't know, man. We done a gazillion tours. Our first tour of the States was an arena tour, you know. And I remember the very first tour that we done. The smallest place we played was a theatre in Boston. It was 4,000 people. And it was like after like 40 shows of arenas. And I remember walking out that night and be like, it's a small crowd tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you didn't sell yeah. any? Did you think you didn't sell any tickets that night? Like, honestly, I was like, I hope everything's, I hope everything's okay. You know? uh, when you say arenas there, uh, to what size of audiences then would, would, you know, would that have been, you know? Like, well, I know arenas range from... 10,000 to... Uh, arenas whatever. can range from like 5,000 to yeah. 80,000, yeah. you know, but we would do, like, I think like the biggest one we ever done was Rotary Club was like 20, 17 or 20,000 or wow. something like that. Wow. And that was, and I suppose you were going in and out of states uh, every every day, was it? Or did you stay grounded in some no, places? No, no, you were, there, when we'd done those tours, we'd done them, there was four buses and four trucks and we never stopped. You didn't know where you were. Yeah, and would it have been a case of uh, a show going ahead? You know, like a big band's a show going ahead, and our one being set up, and that show going no, ahead. No, no, it was every. It took. We didn't have to. It only took us half a day to set up the stage and the gear. Yeah. So we were always traveling together. Yeah, and 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 when you were at the shows, like um, uh, obviously there'd have been uh, loads of Irish Americans and other people from other sure. uh, uh, nationalities at at the show buying into this whole concept, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because it became pretty huge didn't it for yeah for 10 years as you say Keith you were out in front of audiences flat out all the Aye, time well had know. you sort of fit uh, you know did you kind of uh because you're as I said earlier on you know you're a business owner uh, you know and uh you're uh savvy with what's going on in your and your and your music and uh, what you do and uh, you were chatting earlier on about um working on your new album and how you're going to put it out and what's the shape of things out there now um would was there a moment, sort of, did you just embrace it all, fall on? Was there a moment that you, you know, you rock and rolled it all? Or was, were you always focused in the sense that this is what I need to do? I'm focused every night in this here. People have bought a ticket. I am going to give my all. Well, I sing. I don't, I've never sang half-assed, yeah. you know, even if I don't want to. Yeah. I just can't. Yeah. The way I sing, I don't like, I'm not like a wee quiet singer. So yeah. if I don't go out and sing, it'll sound like I'm not singing. Yeah, yeah. So um, you, but you there was, you give there, it all. I give it me all, but I'm not going to lie. There was many a night that I walked out and I was exhausted and I didn't yeah. want to do it. But that doesn't mean I don't go out and do my job 100%. Yeah. You know, but even when I started Celtic Thunder, I'd never intended to do it for 10 years. Like I, yeah. Honestly, after the first tour, I was like, I'm not. It was. It wasn't my bag. Like, yeah, but maybe, you know, maybe, but maybe you know, you know the way sometimes Keith, when you get uh, into stuff out, friend, you know, you just get into it, and before you know it, like time just, you know, time ten like years like is a us blink. In Glasgow, like as I say, um, just and lockdown happened. Like uh, we were going out of our teenage years, you know, into twenty years old, and now we're like uh, twenty one, I think, and going into <laughs> this year. You know what I mean? And I, I still think I'm, and then the teenage one. You know. know what I mean? But time is just flowing, and and lots of different things have happened, and. Like ourselves uh, with a festival, and now in here, and this brilliant building, and all the people that use it, and not everything that's going on. You're, you're, you're the same. Like, and you've always been kind of thinking ahead. But like, I, I've seen uh, that uh, when you go and do a big show like that, uh, do you sort of? Is there places that are more sensational than other cities, or does it become just every city's the same for you after? You know, you should say it's oh, just I uh, you know. Like, well, for me, like, honestly, like, the songs that I love to do when I was doing Celtic Thunder, I was the only guy ever to write original music for the show, too, so I got actually got to do some of my own songs in the show, I was going to say, was you, were, you, were the, you, you actually got a song on the album. I got a couple of songs couple on of different songs. records, so. Did When you went in, just, because I was going to chat about that, Keith, too, when you went in there and the album was being written, because uh, I know I chatted to you about it, like, uh, you were in there more or less going, I need to get something on this, because... You felt yourself this is going to be big well, as such. Well, there was just a bunch of all our songs that they were throwing around, songs, and I knew I had songs just as good as the rest of them. Yeah. It's just I didn't have a big name. Uh, and you know, the you way just it works. needed them heard. I just needed somebody to hear them. Yeah. And still to this day, one of the songs that I wrote, if you go on the end of the iTunes playlist, it's still one of the top three out of, out of I don't know, 10, 15 albums. And so it, it must have been all right. <laughs> uh, well, it, it definitely was. And I mean, I suppose uh, that sort of. Uh, for something, somebody like you, did it make you sort of a, a good all rounder? You know, being in that there and seeing the business side of it, you mentioned earlier on there. Did, would you have to do a lot of, you know, like, like anything in life? 
Um, there's always promotion alongside uh, what people need to know here that there's always promotion alongside any big show, anything, any big anything. Where we, and uh, so I suppose it's all about a few landed. I'm just saying in New York. Was it you? Maybe hit the New York radio stations oh, in aye. the morning and and would you have done a few tunes and oh I uh, was things that got you know. Uh, we were just, I was chatting to someone else recently about, you know, the power of radio and different things that, you know, radio can do. And you think, ah, oh, the people's all online, but people still listen to radio stations. For sure. And uh, there's radio stations in every city that have, are influential. Uh, so when you, was it always you or was it anybody else was taken out or did you do a lot of the promotion? Because I know all did. I read about you doing a lot of, you know, because mm-hmm. you had put stuff up over the years. Uh, we all did. We all done. It depends too. Like, you know, it depends what they wanted. If it was a certain song, it would have been a different singer. You know, there was five of us. But I used to do whenever I, whenever I get signed solo, in the middle of all that, I remember doing my own album got released when I was on tour with Celtic Thunder, so I was pro- pro- promoing my own record like early, early morning, and then going and promoing Celtic Thunders, and then you were doing the, the double, su- doing the double, doing the double, like everybody else here. <laughs> Uh, well, for people out there that might not understand, Keith, what the double is, you want to explain to some of your fans what oh, the double no. means? What have I put myself on for? The double is when uh, <laughs> basically you're on the dole, but you're still doing a few side jobs. Nobody here does that. I'm just joking. Uh, but no, if they no, were, if they were, pretty. if they were, it'd be called the double. Doing the you double. Know, just so, because uh, I'm sure out there there's different things to double. So, but Keith not doing the double. I'm <laughs> not doing the double, <laughs> but we're here anyway. So sorry, Keith, you're going ahead. There, I so like I remember like doing some of the promo is a lot of work. You know, yeah. it's just relentless. Like sometimes we would just do promo trips. Yeah, and I think one is that time, ahead of shows like to try and get. Oh, you would yeah. go out just for like a month, yeah. to, a month's tour of doing t- like all the PBS stations and yeah. then the pledge. They would air our show and then the air breaks. They're like, "Well, Keith's here from the show." Uh, and whatever. Oh, I got you. Or you might like I done my own album one time. My first record that I released. Um, it was released on Paddy's Day. Is that right? Maybe it wasn't. It was released around that time. I can't even remember when it was. And we went to, you know, QVC, the shopping channel? Yeah. QVC has an Irish day on St. Patrick's Day. And they'd sold my album on there. And you're on for two, it has 63 million viewers at wow. any given second. And it's wow. like six in the morning. And you're out there. I had a sing, I don't know, a version of End of the Innocence by Don Henley. But I had a boy from Belfast, Barry Kerr, like really cool. Uh, Alan Pipes the top Brilliant. of it so it wasn't Irish but it uh, had Irish fellas uh, you yeah know. yeah yeah but I think it's like it does something like in like two minutes it sold like I don't know 25,000 records wow. or something, which is not which is bad they were like oh we were expecting to sell way more <laughs> so I was like happy days you boys. were out the back jumping like a leprechaun <laughs> thinking this is land in the pot of gold speaking of leprechauns during that show there's a guy that sells uh, marble on it and he sells Connemara marble Later. and the way he pitches it man is make you sick is all you know your ancestors have walked on the stone your grandmother probably died on these stones here and he's making like cross earrings at it and I'm just standing your there great going, great mm. long lost grandfather Uncle Joseph I was playing my song like you know my album first album came out it was doing really well the album was it was number one world music billboard charts in Canada and in America it was number one on iTunes of best sellers Barnes and Noble yeah. And they sent your man out with a leprechaun hat dancing behind me no live way. on TV. I was about what to. What was reach. he on? What was he on? He must have been on some stuff. The wasn't producer it? just thought it was a great idea to send a le- send a leprechaun. He's wearing, he's wearing a big like some Paddy's Day green did, did leprechaun. Give a wee. He was doing the whole. Holy oh, Jesus! Give, give us a wee voice, any wee voice. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did he have to speak to you? I couldn't. And me, I'll never forget. Everybody in my band, we were looking at him and going, "Who the fuck is this guy? Get <laughs> like live on TV. Get this clown off my stage!" And the producer's going like this behind the camera. <laughs> I was looking like it's this. A I'm, all, day. I'm it's gonna a kill you when this is Keith. over here, boys. You're dead. <laughs> I, I'd actually did have a leper horn on QVC. It wasn't nice. Well, so then you you kind of went from uh, uh, Celtic Thunder. So obviously, um, Keith, that would have left you meeting a lot of good connections. Mm-hmm. You would have seen how the industry worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'd have been able to figure out maybe a pathway through it independently, as you are now. Uh, so then you went. Uh, and you put your solo album out. And a lot of people maybe out there, uh, what I would say at this stage is, um, and even your fans now maybe, uh, a lot of people wouldn't have known that you actually maybe, as you said to me way back in time, that you played acoustic guitar at all or you wrote songs because all Aye. of a sudden you you know, you know were on your own, you had the acoustic guitar. The other way, as you say, it was all about the voice and all mm-hmm. about the movement, whatever else. So 
when your first album was put out, you were saying there, you put it out on the back of the Celtic Thunder. So was that your last year on the run out? Of no, no. What happened was that um, Universal were signed the Celtic Thunder, so they were. And Verve Records, which are part of Universal, they um, got taken over by David Foster, who's like the hat man. David Foster's 18 Grammys or whatever, like out there. Yeah. And he was taking over Verve. So I was his first signing back to Verve. But Universal knew who I was, so they kind of seen what I was doing. Because I was on Universal a bunch of times with Celtic Thunder. I met different people, whatever. So that was the label, was what the Celtic Thunder album? Universal, yeah. which has lots of labels underneath yeah. it. So Verve, I was the first signing back to Verve in like, I don't know how many years, because they reopened it up. So it was a big deal to do it with David Foster. You know, I was recording, like I'd done my first album in David's house, basically, and which was crazy. You know, he, yeah. he invented Celine Dion, Whitney Houston, Josh Groban, Earth, Wind, Fire... Um, Andre, you know all them tracks like like yeah. uh, Chicago, um, Bocelli, like loads of big Chicago's big tier one. Aye. if you leave me now, <laughs> I can take away the biggest part. <laughs> but he does all the classic. keys and that, you know. Uh, so and uh, so you went there and you recorded your first album, as you're saying. And uh, so how did that all, you know? Because like I'm aware that. Uh, you had a lot of success out of it, like uh, as you're saying, you had, you had number one in the, the country, uh, world world music billboard on yeah. on in two different countries. And do you think that uh, that uh, being with a producer of that stature and uh, sort of being able to release somebody, uh, you know, something out through somebody like that, you're still in, like you kind of were still independent, weren't you? You know, or you had a label that time. But well, it was Verve Records uh, I was signed to. I had a five album deal. It was a three sixty five album deal with him. Um, and then after the first record, I was trying to work my way away from them because I could tell it was just the most spinal tap. Did you think there was an entrapment, right? You know, in front oh, of your they eyes? Oh, ha they had me, like yeah. for sure. They even owned the silhouette of my fist. They owned uh, everything. Like, yeah. But it wasn't even that. It was the people that were working there, man. Like the, uh, like the head of A&R. One day I went down and he asked me to do, he asked me to cover like four songs. Two of the songs that he asked me to cover were on my first record. I was like, do you know the two of the songs you just asked me to do were on the record we released a month ago? He's like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to hear them in a different version. And I was like, none of these people have a fucking clue what you're doing. Uh, they really didn't. And uh, I was only 25 and uh, I was going like, how do I know this yeah, and you don't? Yeah, and, and that shows, I suppose, a sign of the, uh, the industry that was, uh, that, you know, you think people know what they're doing and obviously they didn't know what they were doing and, and you knew what you were doing and you smelt it uh, right away that things weren't right. So how did you... Skip out of that then. I kind of, I kind of. Well, if you play it coy, you see, if you leave, you basically don't get anything. Yeah. But if they ask you to leave, yeah, you know, like there's certain things, like say your budget was a hundred grand for your first record, but you didn't spend the hundred grand. That twenty grand sitting to get ready for your next record, it's in kind of in lieu. Mm. And I knew there was a bunch of cash that they didn't spend. Yeah. But I knew if I left, I didn't get any of that. Yeah. And I remember being in the final, and I didn't have a manager. You know, when you had the, the CEO, you had the two heads of A&R. I'm not going to name anybody. <laughs> and no, like no, a, I don't have And like another person, there was four of them, you know, in the middle of Universal Studios. And I was like 26, and yeah. I'm sitting there. And I'm going, please tell me to go. Please tell me to go. Because uh, I had an album's worth of songs, Mercy Street, the album. I had it written. Yeah. And they were going, you know, we don't think this is working, Keith. And I was just going, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that was all, uh, well... And I remember at the end of the conversation, they were like, well, you know, it was great having you, whatever. And I says, look, just so you know, I says, now that you've re re released me, I says, you owe me about, I think it was like 30 something thousand bucks. And they were all like, ah, Keith, you know, I think, this is the head of the company. I think we don't. And I says, no sweat. It was a Friday afternoon. And I says, sure, my solicitor, I'll give you a shout on Monday and we'll clear it up. And they phoned me back on Saturday. I was like, ah, Keith, you're, ah, sorry, I would like to uh, commend you on how you handled yourself. You were right, actually, we do owe you. That you know, but it just shows these record companies genuinely. But you were able to get it back out, so I got the money back out, That's and I good. used that to record my second record. That's good, and that got the number one then, the same album that they turned down. I just shows you like, and I and I, caught, I spent half the money to what they gave me. All they had to do was spend fifteen grand, they'd have had another killer record. Yeah, and but they had just seen this sort of. They you just have to, but that's that thing, Keith, um, where there has to be a. A certain amount of units sold, isn't there? And then they kind of go, "Oh, we might be able to do the next thing." Do you know what it is? They always want—they always want to play it safe. 
Yeah. They, they're afraid to do it. Like they wanted me to be the, like the next Michael Bublé. They kept asking me yeah. to do all these cover songs and I'd already, yeah. I'd done Celtic Thunder for six years. Yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm, I didn't come to you. I could just stay and do that and get paid. Yeah, yeah. And they kept asking me to do all these covers and I was like, and I had a, a record of all original songs and they were just like, they're, no, it is. They're afraid they rock the boat. If they make ah, a decision that's wrong, because it's their they lose next. their job. It's their next in the line. You know, whereas if they make a decision that's wrong, it's me that's always... It, it's, it's always about the next big thing, isn't it? Next you know, big thing, you know. And I, and I know, I, I suppose, for you, uh, like, but that's, you know, you've it's, if you look back, you know, you, you had, uh, you were in the studio with The Verve and then all of a sudden you're in another great uh, arena with a, a label, a major label. Mm-hmm. And then you released your own... Uh, uh, records and then all of a sudden I seen a thing about you one time you landed in Monaco was it in Richard Branson's boat and uh, was that uh, <laughs> uh, like uh, how did that come about did you get a wee dinghy or something did you, you know, uh, it was just a wee dinghy uh, no well actually it was my buddy Glenn Stearns shout out to Glenn Glenn's got a great podcast too called Grit Happens Glenn is the undercover billionaire if you ever watch that on uh, well, we say hello to Glenn then say hello to Glenn Glenn hello hello Glenn Glenn we love Glenn don't we if we do because if a, you love him I'm going to love he's him he's a rock star you would love him right. he's, Glenn, he's a legend maybe he'll maybe speak to me or maybe he'll not let me on at all maybe I'll speak to him and maybe, maybe speak to won't. him through you Keith Keith through him to be into me over to me right? I'll, I'll, so, I'll send him your number so, he's a legend um, but Glenn um, we, he invited me out to Branson's Island one time I hate telling these stories people think your name's dropping but it's all true uh, <laughs> no it's alright because no, it's, it's, <laughs> at the end of the day there's people out here I suppose they know you just from Celtic Thunder. This is you telling people that don't know you what what it's all about, and you're still a down earth guy. It's just another story, so right. bleeds it out there, and uh, and you've you've respected the man that that the boat you were on already. Oh, so I, I tell the story. Man. So Glenn invited me out to Richard Branson's island. This is about seven eight years ago. He played an event for uh, what was it? Uh, can't remember what the name of the event was called. Anyway, I was out there for a long weekend with all these really cool influential people, um, and they were all telling different stories. Kim Fu, remember the girl, the photograph of the girl from the Vietnamese war, the wee girl that was napalmed? Yeah. She was there talking and... No way. Was Char- it like a big, uh, a big conference type No, thing? there was only about, um, there was only about 600 privileged kids there and yeah. they were brought out because they're like super smart underprivileged kids. Yeah. Horatio Aljo. Yeah. Uh, Horatio Alger was the name of the charity. Brilliant. And they had all these really cool, Charlie Plum was there. He was the, he's the longest man in captivity in the Vietnamese war. No way. Ah, uh, really cool. Like, you uh, know, um, and in a way, then they had me there to be like the entertainment, the young guy to hang out with the kids and whatever. Brilliant. But I was there for three days and uh, we ended up on the third night. Richard came and he says to me and Glenn, we were at the bar and, and he's island, the Necker Island. And he's like, hey, do you think, Keith, would you, like, it's my 65th birthday next week and uh, my daughter's coming with 15 of her friends. Do you think you'd want to stay and play? <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> and I was young and single at that time. Yeah. And I was all, ah, ah, all right, die. do you mind? Like, <laughs> <laughs> And I ended up playing at his birthday. And then Sam, the son, came in pretty friendly with Sam now too. Um, and then they, uh, we ended up, it was three weeks I was on there. And I ended up just like I had a big beard like this. And I only had like two pairs. I was only here for two days. It was three weeks later. Was it like abandoned? You know, just... It was like castaway. A Tom castaway, Hanks, uh, only in a really nice <laughs> so island. Like, you know, I wasn't... You just going, where am I? <laughs> it was funny. Like, uh, there was like an Irish guy working there. Uh, Oggy. And I, after like the third day, I met him like a week later. And he's like, are you still here? I was like, dude, I don't know how I'm still here, but I'm still here. But I had to leave anyway. But anyway, Glenn... Um, as a really good friend of mine and Glenn has a very nice boat and we went to the Monaco Grand Prix there three years ago now because I seen you had a picture and I just I heard this it was amazing like uh, it, it looked, really was it looks mad that the cars actually are that close in the road and you could just Aye. see loads of yachts and you know there was no wee canoes about like no. it was all you know and so did you perform in the boat or what was the cracker just well, have was a good party it, you know it was, me your friend I'm, Glenn, I'm good friends with Glenn but uh, like you know if you're mates you bring a guitar out and you have the uh, track yeah. but he had this guy called DJ Ravi who has this drum kit made by NASA this big clear drum kit but he's like DJs in the middle and all there's all people like drinking cocktails and shit but they give me the fucking prince and princess of Monaco come onto the the boat because they knew Glenn and they're part of their fans of the Eagles there and Glenn had an old Takamini with five strings. He's all, but he just doesn't get it. Glenn, he loves music. He's all, get up and play a song. I was all, what? <laughs> what do you want me? I was like, bananas. We were drinking all day. Almost. <laughs> we were there for two weeks. Like, and I ended up and played Taking It Easy. And the Prince and Princess of Monaco was there dancing. And we ended up getting an invite the next day to the, cast, the, the palace. Brilliant. And we went up and met them and they were super cool. 
<laughs> and you know, but th- that experience, uh, these are really famous uh, um, socialites, isn't that right? The More or less, I... yeah. And uh, it's somewhere that uh, I suppose there's a lot of that, a lot of party, and a lot of stars that go there. And mm-hmm. uh, here you are, a guy from Born Foot, uh, hilarious, just, like uh, Blinge Dan. But you're, that's amazing, Keith. You know, it was <clears throat> for you. And uh, so whenever you uh, you were saying there about your friend and and the boat and all the rest. Um, you all, you came out of that there, and you kind of then went to setting up your own tours. Mm-hmm. You know, I know we spoke before, and um, uh, you're a very independent uh, person. And uh, I remember being up for people out there in Black House. We'd speak about after uh, um, a great place to stay. And I remember you talking about getting the right tour manager, Patty, and getting the right people around you, and uh, that everything's effective, and everybody arrives in time, the gig set up, every, we're it's ready all about, to go. It's all about the right people. And like you're at the stage, you've tried different people, you've seen the, the, the industry people that have come forward, you've seen, and look, we know there's great people out there, and there might be somebody out there, maybe listen to this podcast now, that does tour managing and does it really well, and if they want to get in touch with 100%, Keith, 100%, definitely get in touch with them, because it's something you said you were, you were looking for. Yeah, I am. Uh, on behalf of that side, uh, of the industry, what do you feel, Lens? Uh, missing because you've done a lot. Like, but people should know is uh, you may be from Donegal, but you've spent so many years in the USA. And I'm a citizen, <coughs> I'm, Ameri- I'm an American citizen now, you know. You've still got American. the American, I'm an American citizen. Give, I became us, a a wee, citizen. give us a wee line there. We'll do you know what's crazy about the coming? Oh, say, can you see? By the dawn, should we stand up? La- Probably should stand right, right, right. <laughs> no, We're not going to do the whole thing. Sit down. Do no, no. Are you right. only if you do the jig? Right, right. Oh, say, can you see? <laughs> there you go. There's a wee Irish jig and a wee bit of American. And that's me meeting you with love, all right? All right. So, so go ahead. You were saying there, Keith. Well, I'm an American citizen now. I spent 10 years there. I lived in LA for 10 years. Like. I was at in LA and I know you met. Your, 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 my your wife, wife Kelsey there but how what, what was the idea there was it just a case of I'm just staying on a plane you know well when I got signed the Verve I was there like every wet week and they were always putting me up in this crappy apartment well not a crappy I just I didn't I, grew, I came from like you know being on tour and living in Donegal and I didn't want to spend every week in this wee apartment and yeah. you played the guitars once banging on the walls and stuff so ah. I ended up getting my own place and I ended up just one day I just moved I didn't, I didn't know anybody ah. you know and I went and bought an old boat and lived in the boat for four years, so did. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't as nice as Glenn's boat, I can tell uh, you. That uh, much. <laughs> well, Glenn, if Glenn wants to give you his boat from down from his boat now, then that'd be a nice boat. My too. boat was like the dinghy of his boat. I so know, was, uh, I know. More of an old blow up Port Rush one. Was I? We had an old tarp. <laughs> <laughs> we used to get old tires from the, the big tractors, you know, and we'd get a guy to pump them up and we'd go out to the Miola and you just sit on them, you know. <laughs> it was the closest uh, to sort of exotic holiday. 100%. But, uh, so, how was then? Uh, like you, you said there, you stayed uh, four years in a boat. Like, uh, w- was that just at the edge of the city, or uh? it was a Marina del Rey, right in the middle of Venice Beach? Yeah. Um, like a Marina del Rey is just like a block over from Venice. Yeah. Um, and the apartments they were putting me up. That's how I ended up in Venice. You know, if it had been somewhere else, I was just already. Is there. that somewhere where, 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 where artistic people would have loved? For sure, in? Venice yeah. is class. It, it used to be a lot more artistic. Now it's very like it's a lot more tech. A lot yeah. of Google and Snapchat yeah. all live there now. Yeah. When yeah. I went there at the start, it was a lot different, you know. Yeah, but that, that I suppose that's uh, showing you from, I suppose, like any uh, busy uh, metropolis like uh, LA or wherever, or New York, or whatever, London, Paris, uh-huh. wherever, they have their phases of what happens that generates them. Yeah. Well, you, you look at Venice Beach, like Venice Beach, the reason why Venice is called Venice is because it used to be like Venice, Italy. Every street was a canal. There's still wow. a canal system in the middle of Venice Beach. And it was a guy called Abbott Kinney. There's two streets named after him. He was like the main dude. And back then, Venice Beach was like Bondorn of LA. People used to go there on their holidays. There was wow. nothing up to it. And it was just yeah. a beach. Where, and it was these beautiful, you know, see the pictures of the canals. But even from all Did that. Did he design all that? He designed all that. It was all man-made canals. And the tide filled all of it. Wow. Like, if you drive around Venice Beach, the roads are super wide. It's because they were canals. Deadly. And still there's some bridges and people have gondolas outside their house and stuff, which most people wouldn't know about. So it's sort of taking one part of the world and putting it somewhere else? A hundred percent. The yeah. guy was like super eccentric with lots of money. Yeah. But even you think, you know, everywhere comes in peaks and troughs. Venice went yeah. from that to one of the ropiest areas in all of LA. Like you, no like even all the dude, it was gangland, the reds and the bloods, like it, the yeah. bloods and the blues, it was all gangs. Was this, and and, and when, when you say that about gangs, for people over here that might not know much about that, is that sort of like... Uh, bloods so, and cribs, sorry. So the different sort of gangs that 
that run out of the city. But uh, is that just a case of um, areas not being invested in and areas being left behind and people being left behind? Well, what was is Abba Kenny, like, stopped, I think he basically stopped looking after it and the canals and all were, like, way too much money to look after. They yeah. started filling them in with stone and the property prices went down. And then gentrification happens again. Yeah. You know, in the early yeah. 80s, you could have bought a house in Venice for 200000 Now the same house is probably worth $15 million. Jeez. You know? And then all those artists started moving in. Yeah. And then gentrification happens again, even higher again. Google and Snapchat move uh-huh. in and all those artists have to move out. So, <laughs> yeah, cause, and, and that's because they are the now. They are the now. And they are the now. And that's something, I suppose, that, uh, and it's all over the world. Same I mean, everywhere. Most of the, the big cities now, <clears throat> as you know, our friend, they've got representatives of all them companies mm-hmm. that you mentioned there. Mm-hmm. And if any of them companies want to come in and sponsor your <laughs> podcast or my <laughs> podcast, Ad break. Google, if you're listening. If you're listening, hey. We love you and Keith loves you. I use Google every day. Yeah, and Facebook, look at our faces. We are so why. happy to know you. I know. Yeah. And, uh, but the likes of yourself, um, I noticed there recently, uh, Jane Seymour, uh, very <laughs> famous uh, Bond lady, yeah. uh, who is a good friend of your own as well. Uh-huh. And, and what I suppose people should know, uh, uh, know too is that uh, Jane Seymour is a huge advocate of charity causes. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that right, Keith? Yeah, that's how I met her. And that's so, that's amazing. And I remember uh, a picture going up with the two ends together. And uh, now in, in Black House recently, she appeared again. To uh, you. Uh, was she in like an Irish tour? Or was she doing something to do with work? She's or? filming a movie in Dublin <laughs> at the minute. There you go. Um, she's 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 been there for I think she's there two months now. She's here for another couple of months. Um, uh, Jane's a sweetheart. You know, I mean, she's a seventy year old, amazing looking lady for seventy. It's incredible yeah. how she looks. It really is like yeah. it's insane how well she looks. Yeah. But she's a sweetheart and she's a rock star and she's been around the scene for a lifetime. Yeah, she's seen it. Yeah. Like you name any, like her son Johnny. I was like, why is Johnny called Johnny? She's like, oh, his uh, godfather's Johnny Cash. There you go. And I'm like, what? There you go. And she'll start going on the spiel about Johnny Cash and then uh-huh. like, or like well, the other day they were talking about Freddie Mercury and she's like, I was Freddie's date at a thing one time. She pulls up a photograph of her and Freddie with all this like Lady Gaga clothes <laughs> on, you know. Weird. You know, just yeah. incredible. You know, she was the first Bond woman she done. But not only that, she's extremely down the earth. Yeah. She loves the crack. She yeah. loves normal people. Yeah. You know, she's been in that scene for a lifetime. So yeah. she. And do you think it, that sometimes, uh, uh, would you agree in that world that sometimes it's just ordinary people that people from that world are happy to sit and talk to because they're, 100% they're, you're not looking at her going oh you're a because you don't do that because you've met that many different people mm-hmm. and I think it's just a human thing isn't it you just greet somebody and go oh, how's it going there you, you know, 100% you're looking beyond because there's always that situation as you say you talked earlier on about uh, being up and being down well this isn't I suppose a down scenario but people that are big in something can walk down the street and other people won't know who they are For it's sure. only when you're in that situation like the gig or the um, the film premiere as you 100%. say or whatever that is or or, or uh, Monaco with the big day out and uh, uh-huh. the, you know the charity or whatever uh, and your friendship then how long is that with Jane? Ah. Um, I've known her since since we were married six years now, so I must know her five, six years. It's around then. You, you, talk, you talked earlier on there about David Foster, mm-hmm. uh, the producer, uh, and uh, who is connected to uh, the Eagles, if you... Well, no, he did, I don't think he'd done the Eagles, no. He, no. Did he do the Eagles? He probably did. I mean, he probably did. He, he's like, he done... He done um, who did he do? He done Josh Groban, Andrew Bocelli, Celine Dion, Whitney Houston, Chicago, Earth, Wind, Fire... To name it a few, like he was the main. And do you guy. still sort of talk to people like out there and uh, David? No, I never yeah. really. I mean, I done most of my album between his house and his son. Um, what he called Brandon Jenner. You know, the Jenners, like I have done my first. I recorded most of my album their pool house in Malibu. <laughs> the one, the ones at the TV. The show. Jenners, I Brody uh, and Brandon. I, I know uh, Brandon pretty well. Brandon's a uh, sweetheart as well. Uh, Brody, I don't really know that well. And was it a sort of Was Caitlin. it a normalized house? You know, was it normalized? House I was so. Were you that engrossed in the the, the I was the so album? innocent, you, you know. Like to be honest, I remember the first day I went in there, and their mom's Linda, Linda what? I can't remember his mom's name. And there's a picture of this beautiful blonde girl with Elvis, and the first day in the studio, and it's the pool house outside their house. And I was all, who's that there? I was all, who's that there with Elvis? And uh, I remember Brandon going, "Ask me mum." And I went, <laughs> and he goes, "No, ask me mum. My mum used to date Elvis before he died for five years." And I, was, I remember thinking, "Where the 
fuck am I? <laughs> Where am I right now? What's going but, on? But lad, you get some great situations for yourself and uh, to like um, the connectability to the old uh, that whole sort of trailblazing world of rock and roll in, in America. You know, you talked with Johnny Cash here, and then you know you're talking with you know the different people that that are connected to the big. The old stars. It's just when you're living in LA too, though. I think is it just normal? Going it's to the normal. Shop? Is it's normal. Going to the shop? Is Aye, it? it is normal. So you go to the shop and you see some dude that's a big actor. And you know, I think like I, I would carry on. Like I don't even tell people here half the time because you know I get it. It's so alien. I grew up here. You don't hear about any of that stuff living here. But when you're living in LA, it's like, it's it's normal to get a phone call and be like, hey, uh, such and such is having a party tonight. Do you want to call around? And you're standing there in somebody's house, and it's like. Who could be P Daddy's house for all you know? Do you yeah, know, you're just, just caught like, up in it. You just get, you just end up in things like that all the uh, time. And there. maybe it's a good enough thing being released back home out of it. Oh, for sure. Uh, it's great to get away uh, from it. Uh, and and <clears throat> like you mentioned, your early releases, you had also a Christmas album that came out. Aye. I went to number one. Uh huh. And uh, you spoke that uh, you recorded that back home. Did you I say? recorded here at the studio at the house? Yeah, because yeah, uh, I mean to put out a Christmas album, I suppose with you know all the Christmas songs that are coming out to get it to number one in, uh, uh, in the world uh, sort of Aye. charts is, is really good does that help you as an artist uh, you know keep the faith and or was it just something you wanted to do because you're a quite spiritual guy too you I know didn't, like I, mean? I didn't like you know um, like I, I just think you know a lot of times Christmas albums are like they're so contrived a lot of people's Christmas albums you know they're like very like just so contrived and I just want yeah. to make them sound like normal Christmas songs I don't know and then I went even Further than that, again, I done another Christmas EP, but I made it sound like Willie Nelson. So I don't know. I played everything on it, which means the drumming and stuff's terrible on it. But I played everything <laughs> on it, um, and I wanted it to sound like I went. The first record was with Brian Byrne, and we recorded a full forty-piece string section on it, and it sounds it's an amazing record. But then when I went the, the second Christmas EP, it only six tracks on it, and I made it. I wanted it to sound like he walked into a bar in Texas, and he says to somebody, "Hey, go and play Silent Night." Yeah. And the band just started wearing boom, 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 sad. Yeah. 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 Just like that, you know, and that's kind of You want to get a good feel, a wee sort of uh, uh, an atmospheric feel to it, but More still raw. Very raw. The and uh, one it was picked was up well too. I had done, done the same as yeah. then. It was really, yeah. done and, really well. Uh, and so what do you think then, I uh, suppose, Keith, um, you, you are an Irish-based uh, songwriter, mm -hmm. uh, um, but what's your fan base? Because I know we used to chat it before, because... I suppose that people need to know out here, listen to us, uh, like the people come in earlier on to get a picture with you, that to be aware that, uh, you know, you play here sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. but you don't play a lot in, in Ireland. Is it something that you kind of, do you feel the industry's not built right in Ireland or do you feel that you just, um, you were that long away that you, you find it hard to get back in? Because I know we chatted in the Black House about it. Aye, I, I think uh, it's about everything. Yeah, what's your views on it then? If, you, if it's okay to speak about oh, it. I don't that. care. Uh, I mean, like, I, I mean, I've been gone for a long time, so I've been out of the scene here forever. Um, but I do feel too, you know, and I don't mean this in a bad way. This is my opinion on it. doesn't mean it's right at all. I feel like here, a lot of the industry here and a lot of the bands here are very caught up in here. You know, like I'm a I'm a an, an Irish artist. You think internationally? I I I don't I don't understand why like you know people name like the best album of and I'm not taking from anybody. I got anything fair play to these uh, hats off. Yeah. I really mean that. But like they do a lot of the awards here, you know, and they're naming like the best album, best selling album, of whatever. And I'm like, like my record, and he might even get nominated on. Yeah. So because what you're not playing here, uh, which I don't, I don't understand that so concept. You think, you think um, by not being aware, if that's all right, being visibly aware, maybe uh, so uh, presence. I mean uh, that uh, there's an element of sort of not knowing you're here, not knowing you're if you're a multi uh, or, or maybe one, it's one just or not knowing that you've got number ones, not knowing that you have been all over the world, and not knowing that uh, you're continuously releasing stuff. Is that what you're, you know? Yeah, or <laughs> maybe it's because you're not here, and they're going, well, he doesn't play here, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but is it something you would think about, you know? Uh, For sure. I mean, uh, this is where I'm from I and this know, is where I, I cut know. my teeth and uh, I've played up the rock. We uh, use yeah, 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 you definitely have. And, you and for people out there, you'll be playing down here again. No and, bother, uh, like. because, but do you think it's just a, a matter of uh, maybe, like you mentioned earlier on, uh, um, being on uh, uh, RTE shows and different things, you know, at the time, you know, when we were drinking a cup of tea. Uh, 
like that sort of network again, would you go at that network again? Because you are well used to going on radio stations. And if you looked at it in, I suppose, uh, an Irish mapping sense, there's uh, so many on the way down, I suppose. And it's, I suppose it takes, but you're like talking earlier on, you're that busy now. Aye. It's hard to do everything, even though uh, like uh, it would have to be starting, as you say, from scratch. But is it, is, is it something you're... For sure, I'd love to do it. Uh, I've honestly never had the time to do it. You know, Aye. that's the truth. The last time I'd done a PR thing here was the first time I'd done it. Aye. And the only reason we'd done it was because we'd three days off and I knew I was flying into Dublin and my album happened to come out that week. And I was yeah. like, we might as well. You know, for me, in my touring brain, I'm like, why would I drive all the way to Derry with an album out and not stop off Aye. in places and do stuff? But it you worked know? for you, Keith. It worked very well. Uh, and I suppose it's maybe just at, uh, for... Well, then what we'll say is if there's somebody listening out there that maybe, you know, uh, someone that sets out uh, gigs and tours in, in Ireland and... Uh, you are happy to speak to them and uh, no sweat. you know uh, to have a chat to them and maybe set up something for you in, in the island north and south for sure because I think people should be hearing uh, what you're doing because well, thank you. you know you have a you have a good long story and I think it's we've chatted about it and I suppose it's just getting that wee and I know that I suppose like anything uh, throwing anything out uh, into the universe first time is always daunting I mean we chatted like you started doing podcasts I'm stuck in the middle of it there's none of us really uh, designed on uh, trained up in podcast or what we're supposed to say or whoop we're, well, we're say. very good in the art of bullshit though but we are good at chatting blubber <laughs> uh, blubber for people out there is a bit like blabber blabber right and it, it's a sort of a a, 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 a sort of Pile of words put together that make no sense whatsoever. Is that no, right, Keith? What would be the American word for blabber out there? Jibba jabba. Jibba jabba. I thought that sounded like some obscure jibba jabba. Uh, fucking quit, uh, rainforest. Quit uh, your jibba jabba. <laughs> That's like what he called him. Mr. T used to say it, didn't he? Quit your jibba jabba. <laughs> He's different. He's Mr. T. <laughs> He's let it say anything, you know? So, Keith, and sort of going uh, back now to, uh, or to, to now, you're. Uh, you set up now your own tours, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were like, uh, I suppose what we want to talk a wee bit about here is uh, we're all aware, uh, and people maybe should be aware in uh, the rest of the world, that where we live now, um, uh, I suppose you live in Donegal, but you mentioned Derry, so you're, you're, you're still, uh, you know what I'm on. There's Brexit out there now to go and tour around Europe. Yeah. Uh, there's different tariffs and different things. Um, we're not sure how gigs will return, Keith. Um, um, I know you can speak a bit about the American side, what's yeah. happening there. But uh, we are at a stage now where I suppose it's only about outside gigs at very small numbers. Uh, and I suppose like the whole trust in going to gigs again. So uh, for you that travels more internationally, uh, 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 what would the sort of European setup be now for you? Because I know a lot of bands are saying there's so many different tariffs and there's so many different things going on. That, and a lot of people, uh, because you're an Irish artist, you will not have to worry maybe so much about the European thing. Maybe I think so. I, and I think a lot of people uh, from the north are maybe uh, looking at that with the Irish passports and trying to, uh, dual passports even, to try and get over and, and try and make it viable, Keith, you know? So what's it like then for you now? I know you said earlier on to me you'd cancelled... Uh, you tour Tours, twice, I. and you've got an album sitting, and you've an hour album, and you're you're not sure what to do. So what's it what's it going to be like for you now with all this? Well, firstly, on? I would just like to say for anybody that wants to, who's never toured before, or who hasn't booked a tour before, or booked the PR thing, living in Ireland, if you want to just tour Ireland, it's a treat. I never understood it. The more I've been away from here now, and people's like, oh, I've no gear, I want to go on tour. I'm like. You, Donegal alone you could tour Donegal for a month there's that many wee pubs and yeah. music venue like it's yeah. I'm not saying you're making money but you'll have enough to pay for your petrol and you'll have enough to get your name out there it's a paid PR trip and I think I just feel people here need to do that more uh, do you feel that they need to just uh, uh, get out and just do it you have to uh, you have to it's uh, not going to come to, the, the, yeah. the gig you can't yeah. stand your, your living room and yeah. hopefully people's coming you have to put yourself well, out there well you're in a county that produced some great acts you know you've got Clannad and you have Enya and you have all the different uh, uh Donegal artists that have come out and been successful both in the trad world and the commercial world. You uh, have to get out and play. And I think, I don't know, people here just like, there's so many opportunities of cities and towns where you can call people up and get a gig. You know, yeah. you don't have to have a name. You can get gigs in any bars in, Ireland, in normal times, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I will say to the people, like your question about touring now and from the UK to Europe, I mean, honestly, it's not much difference from me having to go to the States apart from when I have a, now I'm a citizen, American citizen. Like for years, I had to organise passports, I had to, or I had to organise visas. Yeah. I had to make sure all my band had visas. Yeah, and that's not cheap. 
No, if my there. six month visas used to back then would have been another two to four grand. Yeah. Yeah, so it's no different. Yeah, I think and, you know. So you you can uh, just so people out there know that don't know you, Keith. You uh, you have a band that comes out to the states with you, uh, um, Chrissy Hine. It's mm-hmm. ex band, uh, yeah. a, a fantastic artist too. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, they come to you, and then you're setting everything up. So you have like I, I know that uh, uh, what people should know out there, you're always trying new new things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so normally people would go and either book a bar, book a venue and go on. But you've done that and you've also done where you've uh, got really close to your fans by doing like garden gigs as such in yeah. their houses. Yeah, how, house did that, did, how did that all come about? Like, I don't know, or, man. I've done like one. It was actually the very first Christmas record. I always try to like do the old school way for me. And anyway, this is how I like to release an album. I like to create a, a hype around the tour and hopefully have an album. You know, and the album helps sell the tour, and the tour helps sell the yeah. album. And it it and works. It yeah. works for me. You know. Yeah. And, and the put, merch you bring out as well. All the mer- it all helps. You know, and I'll name merch after the album and try yeah. to make it one like a pyramid it's of stuff. One big you know? heartbeat going at the one you time. Know? Yeah. Um, and I decided, how could I make that even bigger? One time, I was like, I'm going to do a house concert tour, and it was a lot of work. Uh-huh. Like I, I've never been on tour where I've had a like nap during the day. I was like I'm drained. Uh-huh. You know, and even organising it uh-huh. was a lot of work. Was well, that because I suppose you're on display? You're on display from three o'clock in the day yeah. until one at night. Because uh, then people have booked you and, and they're like you, they're your like your diehard they're, fans. They're your promoters that night, aren't they? Well, I promote it and they promote I, it. I, and I, ever, I, you know. I, so is it a case of just like? Uh, a whole family, or is it the case of the whole estate? No, knows you're no, coming, not or? necessarily. It could be pe- like sh- loads of strangers coming. Like fair play to the people that do it. Like uh, they have fifty people. I would cap it at fifty. Yeah. Every night, and the whole tour was a complete sellout. And I would bring booze and snacks and food. So even organising that during the day, you're driving eight <laughs> hours a day and having to stop. There's one thing having to perform, but you're bringing a bar with you as we well. We do. Like that was your all in your ticket. Uh, you know. Oh, so it was all in. All in a party. Uh, I basically brought the party. The houses. That's brilliant. We done. I think we done forty houses all across America. That's amazing. And what 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 kind of states or where would you been going in that? The whole road? country, the entire That's coast to coast. Up. We started in L.A., done the whole way up and round back to L.A., and then um, we flew the West Coast because it was only three gigs at the end. Brilliant. But it was madness, like because you'd rock and most people were. I'll say now, everybody who done it were very gracious, you know. But you're walking in this stranger's house, Aye. and you're knackered. Uh, and you're like, what's the crack? Uh, Thanks very much for having us. Uh, and we were very grateful, but uh, it's tiring. Uh, and uh, but you're so respecting them because they are putting the, their, their hard a bunch, cash in. And like you're, they're crazy, like uh, you know, inviting a bunch of strangers around uh, your house. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, but it works. It worked. Uh, and like, the only thing was, some houses you would go to, I would walk in. I'm like, where's the room? And they'd uh, be like, you're on it. And I'd be a wee tiny room full of sofas and everything. Oh uh, no. So me and the I, boys be literally lifting sofas out of rooms uh, and trying to or, like trying to set up a different uh, venue. People were thinking right, where are they? They don't organise uh, gigs. Maybe you know you brought uh, you brought the beer, you brought the snacks, you brought the band, you brought the music. What you maybe we need to send us a wee writer to tell them. This we is did. How you need oh, to we clear don't. Out. We we vetted everything. Like, <laughs> you need to clear out your your, your you know, sitting room. Yeah, some the people you know, you and know. it's not their fault. They don't do gigs. No, and but that was I suppose, but showing you that you, you've done all the different parts, you know, and. Uh, have you any sort of uh, thought about the likes of, uh, you know, well, going now to, to your, your place, uh, Glack, Glack House? Uh, Glack House, as you said earlier on, is 150 years old, just for people out there. It's a tourist accommodation. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this where we should put our wee ad? You ready? <laughs> <laughs> Glack House. Perfect for staying near the beach. How close to the beach are we, Keith? We're less than a mile. Less than a mile. What kind of... Uh, uh, can we expect when we arrive, Keith? Tell the people out there we what Glack House is. We have cabins. We have a full Irish bar with a big open fire. That's not open to the public. We don't sell booze. But when you rent the place, you're welcome to use whatever you want on there. We have hot tubs since the last time we were there. Um, we have loads of outdoor hang areas. We have a full stage for when we're allowed to do events again. And if there's people come and stay and want to do a wee strum, they're more, welcome. They're more than welcome. More than welcome. More than welcome, you know. And uh, so, Keith, for people out there, you have put a lot of effort into uh, Glack House, as you say, five years. Uh, it's uh, we're now waiting. I suppose people listen to by the time maybe they listen to this. Hopefully, it'll all have opened up again. Hopefully, uh, but people can find it online. Online, I uh, Airbnb, Glack House, Instagram is Glack House, G L A C K O. And it's close. You just, it's just, I don't know. It's only a few miles from Derry, isn't it? It's fifteen bucks in a cab from Derry. 
you know. 15 bucks, which is uh, about... Uh, <laughs> 12 sterling. <laughs> about no, 12 no, sterling. It's, about, it's about 15 pounds sterling. It's so about 15, 15 pounds. Hey, Jesus, I don't know what you're giving or what kind of taxi you got from Derry, hey, but it's at least 15, 15 euros. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's somewhere where people could get you and stay. Uh, so you were saying earlier on about your albums, like uh, what's, what's your plans for the album? What's the plans for you in the future, Keith? And Because uh, I know... Uh, we were chatting earlier on, and uh, you've been in Portugal for a wee while, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you've said it's a wonderful place. It is, yes. Uh, is uh, is it somewhere that you would ever think about, you know, um, uh, going for a wee while to recoup, or, or is it somewhere yeah. just as a holiday place? Because I know you really liked it when we were chatting earlier on, a cup of tea. I think we might try and make a move there, maybe later in the year if we can. Yeah. Yeah, I, would, I, I love it there. Yeah. You know, it's a good way of life. Lisbon for me for flying a lot. Lisbon's got the, the airport that is Lisbon, which is like twenty five minutes away from the place we stay. Um, you also have like cobblestone streets and beautiful like Donegal style places. Looks yeah. a lot like California actually. Yeah, you know. But then you forty minutes from Lisbon, where you've got the most amazing high end restaurants, and it's a really cool sort of area. So is it somewhere that's drawing your heart at the minute? For sure, it has Galaxy. been for a long time. Yeah, and, you know, uh, I, because I suppose. Uh, You've got your your place now, and, and Glack, it's ready to roll. And uh, I'm sure that uh, it can. Uh, uh, there's someone out there. We're looking for someone out there yeah. too. If you're really good at changing sheets, smiling at people, and unclogging toilets, give me a shout, please. Give the man a shout because we all know about that there, and now and, and the old festival world, you know. And talking about Glasgow Festival that you played. Uh, can I just say though? I want to say yourself and Stella, you should get like some sort of Northern Ireland award for. <laughs> And all the rest of the team, I really mean it, man, because what oh, you created was like one of the most amazing things that music scene wise was, it was probably the most amazing thing. It really was, man. It's such a credit to you and the people you brought together and the vibe you brought together. It was all about you two creating it. Like, oh, thanks very much. And for that. it was such, I used to, like, I remember bringing friends up from Sligo. And it was one, I can't remember which one it was, whatever one I was playing at. I mean, Mitz and Sligo were like, this is one of the best festivals I've ever been at. And they're like, but we don't know anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know? good. But but Keith, I brought it up, uh, I suppose, and appreciate everything you say there, respect. Uh, because going back to uh, Celtic Thunder, there was people that seen you at Celtic Thunder that travelled. But I do, I, I'm, I'm sure, I, I know you've had a lot of gigs since that, but uh, there was a family came from Bali. Is that right? To see you. That's right, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was connected to, I don't know, maybe Celtic Thunder as well. Ah, and probably. I thought, like, here we are on top of the Sperns. <laughs> Just for people to know out there, Bali's a long way away. <laughs> I don't know how far away. It, it wasn't Bali Mac, <laughs> like. <laughs> it's not Bali Mina. <laughs> or, 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 or Bali McGorty. No, this it definitely is Bali, wasn't. As, uh, I think it's the B A L A, Keith. Uh, and, uh, but that, I just wanted to finish that note uh, to show the power of uh, what you have achieved over the years. <laughs> and for people out there, maybe even from Derry and Donegal and uh, surrounding counties and uh, everywhere around the world, uh, I hope that they get a bit of insight into what you're, you're doing. Uh, I wish you the best and everything you're doing. Thanks for coming down the day and uh, taking time out. Um, we normally do them at night, but you have got up early in the morning. This is like 5.30 a.m. Uh, thank you. It's Paddy's <laughs> Breakfast Show. And here we are. Croissants and all. This is our favourite ad. Croissant. Big Joe's Croissants. Do you want one? Yes. Try one with the jam. Keith, would you like one? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. Sorry for the ad break. You know we love you. Oh, give me a wee shiny teeth. Look there. Ding, ding. <laughs> we love you guys Keith, thanks so much for coming safe journey home and uh, 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 congratulations uh, should have said too you're a father as well father I think party. I said earlier on and Kelsey I wish you as well thank whatever, you very very you do, much man give yourself a round of applause and thank you to all the crew that work with us from thanks everybody thanks party yeah,